Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show. I'm Miyoko Taylor. I'm going to be up next. I am a two-time best-selling author and life and transformation coach, and we're going to talk about some amazing things today. We're going to talk about how to set boundaries and why they are the key to overcoming work-life imbalance. And we're going to talk about how to say no to everyone else and yes to yourself and how this will dramatically transform your life. So stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. I'm your host, Prospat Tarovinga, and today we're going to be diving into the realm of self-discovery and empowerment with none other than the remarkable Miyoko Taylor. Now, Miyoko, how are you doing today? I'm excellent, man. How are you doing? Fantastic. I gotta ask, man, that name, how did that come about? <laughs> well, my mother thought she made it up. Um, father was father was in the military. Mother thought she a lot actually a lot of us have unique names. There's six of us, um, including me. So um my name is actually from Japanese origin. Mother thought she made it up. And the funny, the interesting part about it is in Japan, Miyoko is very common, but it's also common as a girl's name. So that's kind of a funny thing. So I I, I do intend on going to Japan someday. So I'll probably be the but of some jokes there, but it's all good. Um, at first, I didn't like it, but growing up, it kind of set me apart. There's not a lot of people that look like me whose name is Miyoko. So it's kind of like a cool distinguishing factor, but that's a little bit of interesting trivia when it comes to my name. Absolutely. So I can officially say, Watashi wa ni honji no tomodashi. <laughs> um, you can look that up when you then go to Japan. But I will. <laughs> For those that are just uh, chilling in, you might be wondering, what are these guys raving on about? Well, let me tell you something. Miyoko is not just your average life coach. Just like he's mentioned, he's got a unique past and also a unique name. So that makes him really, really stand out. And with such adventurous parents, you are now left with luggage to have to defend that name. But that's not what he's here to do. He's the maestro of transformation, the surge of self-care and the virtuoso of saying yes to yourself. And um, I was going to think Miyoko is something to do with saying yes. Let's just let's just brand it as that. And then you can always change it a little bit later. But before we unravel the wisdom he's about to bestow upon us today, ladies and gentlemen, let me just set the stage for what's to come. Now, Miyoko, your journey to becoming a titan in the realm of personal development is very, very extraordinary. Could you take take us back to where it all began? Oh, man. Where it all began, I mean, my father was a pastor. He passed away. Um, it was a year uh, this September 11th. So, you know, September 11th, the United States is a pivotal year, obviously, due to the Twin Towers and those things like that. But it's more even more uh, important to me now because my father, you know, father has passed. So <clears throat> dealing with my particular um, career and what has led me up to saying yes to yourself and uh, self-care and things like that. I My father was a pastor, so I've always been, you know, with the spirit to serve, to help people. So I always told myself that I was going to help people doing something. Um, and I said I wanted to dress up. I wanted to have my own business and I wanted to help people. So I lied to you not years ago, looked in the paper <laughs> for a job and it said insurance agent, dress up, help people, start your own business. So that's kind of where my journey started. So I started doing um, insurance, financial services. And I would kind of, I would annoy my employer because I would get into the homes and I would just basically talk about different things. I would do, I would sell the insurance. I would come out. People would ask for me back. They would offer me dinner, offer me, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables and all these things. So I would find myself talk, giving them advice, talking about different things as opposed to insurance. And it would kind of frustrate, my, <laughs> frustrate my employer. I mean, my managers at the time. And that was probably my first stint with really coaching when, and not really knowing what coaching was which is something that I enjoyed to do. I enjoyed to learn, study about the human experience. You know, what makes people tick? You know, why do we have particular problems? How to solve them? 
just a lot of different things. I became fascinated and I've always had a love for people. Um, so I've been an entrepreneur, man, uh, probably for the over 20 years uh, without knowing what entrepreneurship was. I just felt like there was something bigger, something greater for me to do that was bigger than myself. And <clears throat> I want to say it was probably about 18 years ago. I want to say about 18 years ago, 18, yeah, 15, 18 years ago, give or take. And I had, you know, decided to get a regular job and have the nine to five and, and, and do those particular things. And it was literally, it was literally killing me, man. It was like, I was in a choke code. And I remember one day fast forwarding, I was in a, um, a relationship that I, you know, shouldn't have been in. I was in a job that I absolutely hated. I was dealing with panic attacks, anxiety, all those different things. I remember waking up um, one day and it was just the absolute worst day, man. I dreaded going to work. And I remember coming out of the shower one day and I burst into tears because I literally didn't recognize who I was. I wasn't happy where I was working, wasn't happy in the relationship I was in. And I just felt like my life didn't have a sense of purpose when it came to what I was doing. And I said, you have one or two decisions to make. Either you're going to continue down this road. Health is going to get even worse. You're going to be unhappy. You're worrying about what other people think. So you, you put yourself in this position and you're living a life that's uh, inauthentic to yourself. Or you can make one of the most scariest decisions you ever made and just tell everybody, you know what? I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. This is what I'm going to pursue, like it or not. I obviously took that option and it was very uncomfortable at first, but it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Uh, so one of the things I said, okay, all right, I'm making this decision. So first thing I have to do is I have to get myself straight. So, um, you know, being, like I said, being my father, being a pastor, there was a lot of prayer, a lot of things, you know, soul searching and things like that. But for some reason I went online went on Google and I, uh, t uh typed in how to find yourself. I have no idea why. Uh, so the, one of the first people that came up was Jim Rohn. And I'm just like, who's Jim Rohn? And f f first and foremost, by far, one of the most amazing people in personal development. I have most of his stuff. Um, I just loved his, his style, the way he actually educates and teaches people. So started learning about Jim Rohn. I'm like, who's this guy? This guy sounds this is pretty weird, but good at the same time. Then I saw Zig Ziglar. I'm like, who's Zig Ziglar? Then I saw um, the next person was Les Brown. It's not over until I win. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, what are they talking about? So I'm, I'm starting to learn all these different people in personal development. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Change, for, change your mindset, change your life. What is this crazy stuff you're talking about? So I really started to look and I said, you know what? Let me just start reading because I liked reading at the time. I think that year, Prosper, I probably read over 70 books that year. I got my hands on audio books. I got my hands on ebooks. I got my hands on physical books. And I just immersed myself in learning everything I could about what in the world personal development was because I had never heard it in my life. I was young. And the more I learned, the more fascinating I became by it. So I said, You mean to tell me that I can, if I change my mindset, it can change me from the inside out. It could completely change my environment. And that's what it did. And it was funny because people that were around me were like, one day, you know, fast forward six or seven months later, they're like, who are you? Like, you know, we're not saying that you weren't nice before or anything, but it's just like your perspective is different. The way you're talking is different. Like, what happened? And that's when I knew I'm like, wow, like this stuff is really, really powerful. And I said, I want to learn more about this. And this is like what I want to teach people. I want to teach people like how to pr particularly pursue their dreams and, and what this personal development thing was all about. So that's when I really, really fell in love with personal development, self-improvement, transformation, those types of things. So sought out, got certificates, you know, went into neuro-linguistic programming, NLP and um, a mastering a life coaching, transformation coaching. Um, emotional intelligence, just so many different things when it came to coaching and being an entrepreneur for over 20 years, just the stuff kind of came together. So one of my goals 
was to, you know, work with Les Brown. That was like one of my goals. I said, I'm going to work with Les Brown. So I want to say about maybe four years ago, four or five years ago, I had been working with this very, very successful motivational speaker who I can't name because I was actually ghost writing his speeches for him. <laughs> uh, speech writing and writing is another one of my passions. So that's one of the things I also do as well. So I was writing his uh, speeches for him. And he said, hey, man, I want to do this book. He said, but I want, you know, somebody there in particular to do the foreword. I said, who? You want to do the foreword? He said, Les Brown. So I'm like, oh, okay, Les Brown. All right, cool. So gives me Les Brown's phone number. Les Brown. I call Les Brown up. And one of the first things Les Brown says is, you know, in his Les Brown voice, he's just like, hey, he says, oh, there you are, Miyoko, the prolific speech writer, the writer. So I'm just like, wow. I was just like, Les Brown's calling me a prolific speech writer. And if you're in personal development, and if you know anything about speakers, you know exactly who Les Brown is. Um, so it had hit me that 10 years ago, like a long time ago, I had said I would work with Les Brown. So here I am, you know, writing a foreword, you know, to a book that, you know, he's going to be in the foreword. And I'm just like, wow, it's just amazing when you actually think about something that you're going to do. And it literally manifests, you know, at some point in time, you don't know when, you don't know how, but one of the things I said, and I share that story because it's just something that I want to encourage people that if you really put your mind to something and you're in the same industry and you really have an impact, you have a mission to do something, you will eventually cross paths with some of the best or some of the most influential people in that industry to do it. So that's kind of what happened to me. So when I thought, I'm like, man, I said this 10 years ago. And I'm actually like, you know, it wasn't a big project, but I'm like, I literally actually was able to talk to this man on the telephone, gain access to him, you know, because I was in the personal development industry. And I was working with a speaker at the time who I was actually coaching and ended up helping him in regards to his career as well. So um, I often share that story because it's something that kind of, changed changed my life and, and it kind of gave me the uh, helped me understood the power of manifestation and things like that um but i didn't stop there so gaining all this success working with a lot of these influential people and man i i i got to the point where you know i became a dad became a father my daughter she's uh she'll be four god willing uh, this month in april i'm not this month but next month in april on the fifth and, you know, I was start, I was becoming a father and I was re reaching the success in my business, man. But to be honest, it was just like I was really, really burnt out. My father was getting sick at the time. And it was just a lot of things happening. Relationship was very, very strange. Just things in my life. And on the outside, I was a public success. But in private, I was failing, you know. In my life, I was mentally, emotionally not in a very, very good place at all. And I said, man, you know, I'm achieving all the success and, you know, I still, I still feel like there's more. I still don't feel as successful as I look and people think that I am. And that's when I really realized like, you know what, maybe you need to look at rethink your version of success. Like, you know, go back and do what you did years ago before you even started in this industry. And that's what I did, man. And I realized that one, I was living success based on what other people thought or what success was presented to be. Two, I was really caught up in that hustle culture because, you know, you got to hustle, hustle, hustle. And I love Gary Vee when I have to say this. Gary, <laughs> Gary Vee to me is, is responsible for really blowing that entrepreneurial hustle culture up. Because I remember when he kind of like first was really everywhere. He was talking about hustling and, you know, not getting any sleep and just grinding and just doing what you got to do. And I remember saying to myself, I said, man, one day that guy, I said, he's going to burn out. And, um, you know, not, shortly after that, he started talking about taking care of yourself, still hustling and grinding, but making sure you have time to take care of yourself because it's not a sustainable model. This is why so, so many people are burnt down. So many people have this hustle or die mentality. And the reality of it is, is mentally, emotionally, and physically, that can definitely happen if you don't rest yourself. Um, I got to sneeze. 
Absolutely. And thank you so much for all of that, because what a story, man. What a story. But I got to take you back where it all began again. You did mention you were the son of a preacher man and, um, you know, may, may God, may God rest his soul. But um, yeah, tell us, what, what was it like, you know, um, growing up oh, in that sort of environment with with dad at the realm, because if he was a preacher man, he would have had a popularity around him somehow. Right, right. So my dad was the type of person, man, everybody loved my dad. My dad was strict, but he could connect to people. He could connect to anybody. Um, that's how my father was. So growing up, you know, um, we were around the different people. Um, I, at some point when I got a little older, I was actually reading for my dad. So when my dad was actually teaching the people, I would actually be in the pulpit. I'd be the one reading, finding the scriptures for him and things like that. So uh, we used to travel all over the place, man. Um, pretty much all over uh, the, the Northeast, definitely. And, you know, while he preached, I was kind of like his roadie. So I learned a lot about my dad as an individual, you know, the older that I got. And I didn't really see him. You know, he was my father. He was also my pastor. But, at the, but then we actually developed another relationship. You know, um, we developed that that kinship, you know, with people with common interests, common faith. And it was a beautiful experience, man. It's good to kind of hear people like even now my dad passed and he's, it's been over a year. Sometimes I people talk to me and they break down in tears and they'll be like, you know, your dad was the person that helped me do this. Mm-hmm. Like if it wasn't for your father. And I'm like, I give God all the credit, you know, but I said it's kind of cool to know that your dad made such a tremendous impact and you're still meeting people over a year after him being gone. And they're telling you the dramatic impact that he's made on their lives. So it's, it's, it's awesome. And it's now don't, don't, now don't get it twisted. My dad, my dad, uh, he had, he he stood on principle, especially biblical principles and he was strict, but my dad knew how to have a, a very, very healthy balance. Um, you know, him and my mother. So I, I've been blessed, man. I've truly, truly been blessed. I had an amazing father. And I can definitely say he definitely lives on through his children. Absolutely. And through the, the legacy that he's created, for sure. I value that. I value that a lot. Because it is said that you die twice. The day you actually are laid to the ground. And the second uh, time that you die is when the last person says your name so I, I can only imagine that your dad oh, still lives on and uh, speaking of which you must have started your career a long time ago you know like you said you're writing speeches for this well-known speaker but you were also doing that without realizing with your dad um while you're helping him write his sermons and now now see that now, now that's the thing i never helped him write a sermon my dad never literally wrote out any sermon. Like it's, it's literally one of those things. And I definitely want to tell people, it's really one of those things that when God gives you a message to deliver to people, it just comes. My dad didn't write any sermon. I can't speak for anyone else, but my father, he didn't write any sermon. Um, the way we worked was kind of phenomenal. Um, it's, it's, it was definitely something to see, you know, God would give him something to, to teach about and, you know, I would just go into the Bible, man, and and really kind of just start flipping pages. And whatever my father would talk about, I God would just give me whatever scripture to find that in. It's really, it's really very interesting to explain. And I'm smiling now that I think about it because it's just it's just something that you would really have to experience. Because a lot of people were like, you know, don't you guys study together? Like, you know. How do you come up with the scriptures and and you know that the the sermon will be over and they'll be like, hey, Mioko. I'm like, what's up? They're like, hey, what was that passage that you know um he was talking about in here? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> but I knew when I but I knew when I was up there, but get down, I have no idea. So it's one of those amazing things. Um, and those it, it was a bond that we shared, man. It was it was a natural, it was a spiritual um connection. It, it was it was pretty awesome. It was awesome. Absolutely. And I mean, obviously, this has just been a little bit um, soon, you know, like you said, it's been a year. But if he's looking at what you're doing, what do you reckon he would say? I think (laughs) I think he would definitely be proud. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, there was a moment where, you know, as I was going through the transitioning, you know, of him being sick and him, uh, you know, because he was diagnosed with cancer and then, he, you know, he had chemo and stuff like that. And then he started, you know, to take a decline. I think he would probably look back and be like, now you were in a depression a little too long now. You know, um, he, he would probably critique me on that. Like, you need to just get up and keep it moving type of thing. But I think he would definitely be proud of the the things I've accomplished and the direction my life is headed now, for sure. Fantastic. And, well, you now have a daughter of your own. Um, did you say she's yes. just four? Yeah, she'll be four, God willing, next April, this April on the 5th. Absolutely. And I call her my three nager. That's yeah. what I call her. <laughs> kids now, they're on, <laughs> these kids now, man, they're just different. I mean, when we were younger, it, it's like their intellect is so developed now because of technology, because of electronics. <sighs> they talk in full sentences much earlier than us. Their understanding of, of of verbiage and how to use things are just more far more advanced. But yeah, she she's my three nature, man. She's okay. three, but she's going on sixteen. Absolutely, just blame Baby Shark or Peppa Pig, and oh, whatever it is that they're watching. They're... Right. <laughs> oh, what is it? Coco Melon. Yeah, Coco Melon. Coco Melon. Oh, she's way past Coco Melon, man. She's. <laughs> She's she's on Paw Patrol. She's oh, on uh, yeah, 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 she's on all these other, other shows now, man. My favorite one is uh, Chase. Now, what was life like? Obviously, you did mention. Obviously, your dad was uh, working alongside with you. But what was the sort of relationship that you had with the other five siblings that you had? So, just we have a, a bit of a background of you know what then propelled you to now be the person that wants to serve others. Right. So, I mean, the relationship he had with all of us, all of us kids, it was pretty much the same. I think the really reason why the relationship was different for me and my dad, because we didn't have a special bond, um, different than all the other children is because we're a lot alike. Me and my dad, my mom would always be like, oh, my God, you're just like your dad. And we, we both would laugh. So we, we shared a lot of the same characteristics. Like he had a love for people. I have a love for people. Not to say that my other siblings don't have a love for people. It's just, it was different with me. Like, I love learning around people. I'm the type of person, I love being around older people. Uh, I've been like that since I was a kid. I just love hearing stories. I love listening to experiences. It's just like, okay, what can I actually learn from it? Now, I'm not going to say I wasn't hard-headed in some of my decision-making, as we all can be. But I just loved learning about different things, about different people's experiences, and stories, I know, you know, I mentioned speech writing and stuff like that. I love stories. I love experiences. I love learning what people have gone through, what they have came up, you know, what they have overcome or overcame. And then it's just like, what's the lesson in that? Um, so that's one of the things that I truly, truly love, you know, and outside of being a coach for many years, which I love to do and I feel like it's a calling, and that's one of the reasons why I started a speech writing and, and book creation company, because I believe in the power of telling stories and sharing experiences and just showing people that they are unique individuals. We're all unique. We all have a star. We all have a story. And there's always a lesson and it's two lessons. It's a lesson that shows us what we're capable of and who we are. And then there's a lesson of, what type of process did you go through and how can you help somebody else get out of the same situation or to achieve the same level of success? So I love stories. So it's interesting on this, this podcast show, because I, I didn't realize the connection that storytelling and having a father as a pastor and all this stuff kind of intertwines, man. So I, I appreciate you asking these questions because you actually helped me learn something about myself that I really didn't even look at. So it's quite, it's rather fascinating. Not a problem. Um, well, you've got the story. I'm just the listener here. Now, while you were talking, you also mentioned your connection or the first part into personal development, and that came through Jim Rohn. And one of my favorite quotes about Jim Rohn was, "Don't wish, um, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better." You know. I <laughs> 
<laughs> right. <laughs> All right. And and there's a time when you just wanted things to be easy for you and um, had not done the part of you being better, which resulted in you shedding tears after that shower. Now, so many people will be successful making money, but they seem to be, uh, like you say, a, a public success, yet they are a private uh, failure and they're out there shedding private tears within themselves because obviously they find that something is missing. You then went on a journey right. to that. Right. Um, you know, t t tell us how you then obviously took that on because so many people would have just been right. like, I think that's the life I'm about to live. And, but you took that as a turning point. Well, I think to, to go back to Jim Ron. <clears throat> One of the my favorite quotes from him was, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Yeah. And that's something that I really, really, really didn't understand at first, but I understand it very well now. So I just had to go back to doing the inner work, working on myself. And what I realized is a couple of things. One, I was a chronic people pleaser. Mm -hmm. That's something that 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 statement comes up a lot when I do content, through my clients, through what I talk about people pleasing. The second thing is I had very, very poor boundaries. And this is very, very common with people pleasers. And the third thing, because of my upbringing, because of wanting to help people, one of the things that I found out, and I know it's a very overused word, is that I was very empathic. Like I feed off of the energy of other people. Like, and what was happening to me is because I wanted to please everybody because I wanted to be validated and wanted to be accepted, you know, wanted everybody to be happy, wanted to please everybody. I was very, very, I was overwhelming myself. I was dealing with burnout. So that's what kind of gave me the introduction to burnout and knowing, understanding what it was and realizing I had experienced it several times. So uh, those three things, being a people pleaser, um, really realizing that, you know, I was very, very empathic. And the reality was, is I had poor boundaries. So I started drawing a connection. I said, you know what? I said, <sighs> boundaries, like, what am I, why am I allowing particular things? So I really got into teaching boundaries and teaching burnout and you know how to overcome burnout and self-care and what burnout really is, because most people think the definition of burnout they think it's being overworked in the workplace. No, 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 no. Burnout happens because of a certain behavior that we have. If you develop stronger boundaries, if you implement a stronger form of self-care, and if you really, really learn how to stop being a people pleaser and how to balance that empathic equilibrium of wanting to serve, then your life will get 1000% better. You'll reach fulfillment in your personal and professional life. So burnout. So I, this is what I teach. There's no such thing as work-life balance. And what I mean is that there's no scale that you're going to balance out where it says work, personal life, and it's going to equal out in as far as the time, an allotted time perspective. But you can have the same quality of joy, fulfillment, and satisfaction from your work life and your personal life. That's what people are looking for. They're looking for the fulfillment in the in both areas. They're not looking for, I got 15 hours here, I got 15 hours here, it works. Because the reality of it is, you may work more in your work that day than in your personal life, but what's the quality of the experiences of the two? This is what we're striving for and what we're looking for. So my opinion is work-life balance is really taught incorrectly. And I say that because a lot of people teach it the same way. I don't. Absolutely. You see, now, what you're opening up is that oxymoron of you're literally saying you should say yes, you know, but yes to yourself and no to other people in terms of all these boundaries Correct. and things like that. But this then presents, Miyoko, if you would uh, indulge me for a bit, uh, uh, 
the whole fear of first of all missing out and then second um you know just that whole scarcity mentality of oh if i don't say yes to that i might then be skipped on either a promotion or i might be skipped on a deal or be called in for yet another event or a party and that has now become the core um of what you stand for which is your mission saying no to others and yes to oneself right and so, so people you are missing out you are missing out i want to say you are missing out but here's the thing and i want everybody to pay attention to what i want to say yeah you're missing out on you so it's and that's the only missing out it's missing out on me now fear of missing out on me oh mom now see and, and that yeah and that's the thing people have fear of missing out on the external factors right Right. No, you're missing out on you. And the problem is, if you stop missing out on you, you're going to find a better circle of friends. You're going to find a better environment. You're going to tap into your passions. Things that mean the most to you, things that are important to you. I'm not saying you don't say yes to promotions. I'm not saying don't say yes to particular things. But if you assert yourself, you have the right boundaries, you, you learn how to stop being a people pleaser, and you use that desire to serve and to help people, and you balance that out, now that you need to balance, you balance that out. What you'll find is that you'll be able to make better decisions. You'll be able to see who you need to be around, the environment you need to cultivate, what you're really passionate about, what you've been saying yes to all along that you just need to say no. You'll start to become more assertive, more sure, and you'll get that clarity in your life. Most people aren't clear on who they are. They don't know who they are. They get so lost in what everybody thinks. Everybody wants them to be what society says they should be, what society says they should do, what everybody else wants them to do. And they live that life. How many people out there are successful lawyers, successful singers, successful athletes? And then at the end of the day, we hear, wow, they didn't even really want to do this. This is what their parents pushed them to do. This was what somebody else said they should do. They really want to be a baker. And they're like the, the number one quarterback in the world. But they really want to be a baker. Um, they're an actress. But what they really want to do is play tennis. They love, they have a passion for it. And it's just like, you can do both. This is you. You can do both. Set the boundary. Determine what you're going to say no to from this point on. Stop trying to please everybody because it's impossible. And start to say yes to yourself. Mm. Say yes to yourself. And it's funny. It's like I, I have a trademark phrase. It's like, yes is back because somewhere... Along the line, we just put that on a back burner. Saying yes to ourselves is just cooler to say yes to everyone else until we build up this resentment, this anger. And then we start getting just angry at everybody, man. And, and what we're really angry at is ourselves because we should be speaking up for ourselves. We're angry that this person is not treating us right in a relationship. We're angry because we're not getting that promotion. We're angry because we haven't started that business. We're angry because our health is failing. We're not getting enough sleep. If only we had more time, we got to balance work-life balance. That doesn't work. And it's just like, it starts with you. Question is, why are you chronically trying to please everybody else? Why are you trying to do what everybody, what, what everybody else is doing? What, what psychologically is going on? What behaviors have you developed? Is it trauma-based? Is it something that you develop in your upbringing growing up? Now it's got you acting this way, trying to please everyone. You know, my thing was, I told you my father was a pastor. I grew up and always had the spirit to serve, but you have to be able to have boundaries when it comes to that. Because you still have to put enough time, effort, and energy into yourself. Because if you're not good, then everybody else isn't good. If I'm not good right now, then my family's not good then I can't be the father I need to be for my child. Then I can't be good for my clients and I can't be good for myself. I can't pursue my own passions. See, it's just, it's a bowling ball effect. We forget to, we forget to focus on ourselves first. If we're not better for ourselves, we can't be better for anybody else. So that's why I say psychologically and, and internally, why are you trying to please everybody else? What is it? And a lot of times with my clients, it's just like, man, you know, ever since I was a kid, that's the statement. I was growing up, you know, my parents did this or something traumatic happened to me. And I always felt like I, to be worthy or to feel validated, like I was worthy of something, 
I had to try to please everybody. And that's what I do. I go into this mechanism. I go into this mode. And that's why I'm a chronic people pleaser. Then it affects your boundaries, affects how you feel. It affects your overall mood. You get burnt out. You feel resentful. And everybody thinks you got to go on. You know, you, you got to go on. You got this great life. And it's just like, oh, man, I'm just keeping my head above water. I'm putting out all these fires. I, I, I don't, I lose my, I lost my sense of my identity, my sense of self. I am like really going in over my head here. And this is what I, I tell a lot of people, like a lot of my clientele are women because women naturally are nurturers. And often, often a lot of the times, you know, they're super business people and they're public figures and people in the public eye. And they are still wives, mothers, and people that are still serving people all the time. Now, it's not just women, but I, for some, for some reason, I just connect with them a lot because this is a very, very hot topic for them. You know, um, they're just programmed, you know, from upbringing or just how they are to say no to themselves and just yes to everything else. They're always facilitating everything else. Um, but to go even further beyond that, it's in a place of service. As a coach, you're always serving. Mm. As a social worker, always serving. Um, as a therapist, always serving. As a doctor, always serving. As a nurse, always serving. These types of businesses suffer from burnout and suffer from resentment and physical, emotional, mental, spiritual stress because they're constantly in a place of service and we're not setting the boundary and setting the uh, proper boundaries in place to say, hey, all right, now I've said enough yeses, now it's no and yes to myself. So that's a lot of my clients are people in the pub, in the service industry, um, whether it be those people I named, whether it be entrepreneurs, whether it be public figures athletes entertainers uh you can basically coin everybody in that in that particular area in some way but these particular titles are people that constantly are in the public serving the public some kind of way mm -hmm. and it's just like they forget that you are the most important asset it's not the goal it's not the golden eggs it's the goose that lays the golden eggs you're the goose I like that. I like that. You see, maybe these people haven't been flying for a while, Miyoko. You know what they say when you <laughs> jump on a plane, you put your mask on first because then you will be useful to all of those that are around you. Um, right. If you start grasping for air, then you're also adding to the confusion. Now, you've generously uh, offered a free one-to-one -one clarity call um and i think you've also dropped your balance uh, manifesto guide to our viewers thank you so much for that uh first of all what what are these things and why should anybody jump right now from whatever they're doing to go on a clarity call um with you well first and foremost clarity call is good i think one of the reasons why is because they'll gain some direction on where they're at right now uh they'll get clarity on the steps they need to take to kind of get from that place and to move them closer towards where they want to be, you know, all free of charge, just basically from my heart to theirs and my experiences and dealing with clients and dealing with my own experiences. So that's first and foremost with the one-on-one -on -one clarity call, the balance manifesto. Give, it gives a little bit of background, a little bit more of my story. We go on a little bit more detail and it talks about the three important things and how to overcome burnout, how to start to get, closer towards removing yourself from that people pleasing tendency and to um it introduces you to what boundaries are or how they're created and how you need to go about it now what i recommend everyone to do is i have a people pleaser quiz so it basically what it does it's, it's five short questions but they're very good and it shows you exactly what type of people pleaser you are so there's different types of people pleasers so um, it'll show you exactly what type of people pleaser you are. It'll give you recommendations on what you can do to kind of shift yourself away from becoming that type of people pleaser. And also it gives you access to the one-on-one -on -one call um, also as well. Quizzes, I love quizzes. They're fun to take. And it's just very, very good knowledge to kind of know where you fall in that people pleaser category. So if I was to recommend somebody first, I would have them take that quiz first because a lot of people, we all have some form of people pleasing and that's healthy. And then there's others like myself that was in a position and, and many others in those industries I was talking about that just go above and beyond. They don't have any balance and they just don't have a filter 
when it comes to helping people. It's like, ah, this is my mission. I'm passionate about it. And this is what I want to do. And this is when passion kind of has, has a, has, has a con to it, being passionate and, and, and having a mission. So I would tell them to take that quiz. It's fun. It's, it's interactive. And it really sheds some light on exactly what area you need to improve when it comes to the actual people pleasing category. Fantastic. And I think that's a good way for people to know what they need to do, because obviously fish do not see the water that they're in and neither can people see the air that they breathe. So I'll definitely yeah. put that link, uh, all those links in the show notes below so that people can get started. I'll actually have to delete uh, the quiz that I had lined up, which boss baby am I? <laughs> I <see. Okay. laughs> <laughs> and know which uh, uh, people pleasing person that I am. Now, Neil, I, I know you are wealth of um, information and things of that nature. Um, but as we have realized and established, it wasn't always like this. All right. So oh. let's let's go back to the time when. And congratulations on you know um, you know manifesting that uh, talk with. Thank you. Uh, you know, less brown, you know, and, and um, it's, it's something that when people grasp the energy around that, I, yeah, kudos to you for that. Now, let's take you back to the time when you got out of that shower and you had tears um, mm -hmm. falling down where you mentioned that you were a public success, yet you were a private failure. And um, you then mentioned that you started listening to all these you know, motivational right, right. people when you ended up working right. the ones that you respect. Now, let's just say for some weird reason, this happened to be the motivational tape that you listened to while you just came out of the shower. What would you have wanted to hear at that time, knowing what you know now in order for you to be doing and have a happier existence? This is part of your process. I feel like we always try to get to the destination and we try to bypass the process mm. and everybody has their own process. Sometimes that process involves tears. It involves loss. It, invo it involves um, dealing with situations that are very, very hard, but these are the things that make us. These are the things that mold us. These are the things that develop us into who we are and who we're meant to be. So understanding that it's a season and it's a process, but it's going to develop into you, develop you, into who you need to be now and bring you closer towards who you're meant to be later. So I would tell myself, this is part of your process. This is part of your story. You're, it's just a chapter. It's just a chapter to a, an amazing book, but this is a needed chapter. Pain turns into purpose if you allow that process to take place and to be patient. Like that. See, what you just said there is whatever anyone is going through, they should actually pay close attention to what's happening because one day Absolutely. you'll have a good story to tell on the Online Prosperity Show. And um, it's just one of those things. I, I value that a lot. And patience is grossly underestimated for a lot of people. Yes, you need to go through what you need to go through just so that you become that person that um, can be, do, and have a happier existence. Now, the person that I spoke to in the last hour or so is totally different to the person that was bowling their eyes after the shower. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, oh. Before, before we wrap, wrap up, um, Miyoko, now, could you maybe share any sort of upcoming projects or events or things that our newly found audience can now be excited about moving into the future? So I'll have a yes, yes is back community um, where people like myself and people in these industries can kind of get together, share experiences, share knowledge. Um, I actually have a course called Work Life Mastery. Um, I kind of told you about my take on work life balance. So it kind of walks you through uh, setting boundaries. The whole people pleasing pandemic is what I call it. Um, and it kind of gives you a overall look on boundaries, people pleasing how to actually have that equilibrium when it comes to your work life and your personal life. Um, and I also have a book kind of basing on all the, all my principles too coming out later this year. So um, I'm, I'm a little, <laughs> a little busy with some things. want to get back on the road and actually do some more speaking. I think the message that I have is something that is not often told in the way that I tell it. And again, this is bigger than me. This is, this is something that I feel called and purpose to do. I'm um, in the personal development world and, 
you know, hopefully you guys will see me out there uh, continuing to make a difference and make an impact and some amazing things to come. Absolutely. Now, Miyoko, you just committed the ultimate sin. You do not mention a book and not uh, uh, promise to come back and launch it on the online prosperity show. So, <laughs> I would love it, man. I, I would love it. I, I love the energy on the show and um, I love your analogies and we have some co commonalities here. And so I would love it. I, I would definitely wouldn't want to miss it. Absolutely. There you have it, folks. So if you missed this episode, well, wait for the other one that's going to come as we explore uh, Mioka's uh, upcoming book. But I must say, man, thank you so much. First of all, for those tears that you shared at that um, shower, because they created the man that you are right now. And I can't wait to see the kind of father that you're going to be um, because you've got, I appreciate that, man. you got really big shoes to fill. Um, you know, I appreciate that. All right. Fantastic. Now, folks, what a riveting uh, conversation we've just had with the incomparable Miyoko Taylor, not just comparing in his name, because I try to Google, there's not another <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miyoko out there. So he has to defend his title, world champion right there. Um, from navigating the highs of entrepreneurship to mastering the art of actually just saying yes to yourself. And I think his insights have truly been enlightening. So I will put all the links to the quiz and also to his website and to um, the link for you to catch that one-on-one -on -one clarity call with Miyoko that he has so kindly offered us. And remember, you need to rewatch this episode because I know there's a few nuggets that you might have skipped up while you were just listening to the mesmerizing voice of Miyoko. Now, listen. Now, when you listen for the second time, you want to listen, um, you know, with attention to really help yourself be, do, and have a, a, a happier existence out there. And while you're at it, if this is not yours, send it to somebody else who's going through stuff. They might actually find this yes. video, um, you know, useful to them. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the Online Prosperity Show. Until next time, stay inspired, stay empowered, and always remember to say yes to yourself. Bye for now.